Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Shanaz. Um, it's such a pleasure. I'm so thrilled and honored to be a part of this on-site meeting. Very thankful to Dr. Anil Handu and to Shama and the whole MindRay team for this. And I'll go to my topic. This is my old hospital and this is where I work presently. This is the main uh, referral center for hematology and oncology in Dubai. I work for the government. So I'll, I'm going to talk about, you know, what we all say, atypical lymphoid cells in the peripheral blood. Okay, and uh, I think we all know about atypical lymphoid cells. The term came uh, way back in the, with the publication in 1923, uh, when uh, Downey and McKinley described the react what we know today are the activated T lymphocytes seen with infectious mononucleosis. This is a publication from 1935. Imagine there wasn't so, such good photography, but look at the illustration. And even they have even differentiated uh, how they are different from the blasts. So, so over time, um, oh God, I'm missing. So over time, we've come to know again that because of many immunologic stimuli, often infections and other conditions, you can have lymphocytes which get activated, become larger. The DNA synthesis is increased because of which the cytoplasm also becomes more basophilic. Depending on the state of activation can be very basophilic to pale gray and they are larger. So they don't look, they look different from what we normally see. So the term atypical was used. But, uh, and we are very familiar, you know, various viral infections now with COVID-19. So we see all these cells and we call them atypical, reactive. There are a whole lot of confusing terms. And, uh, but, and usually when we see these blue cells and, you know, patient has fever, even a little bit of low platelet counts, we don't worry too much. We know this is infection, viral infection, self-limited. Sometimes, of course, they can be, and usually the eye will pick up what is more obvious, these beautiful blue cells, we feel safe with them. But I would like to show you, and I have had experience with a couple of cases, when both may exist together, something more sinister lying within. As this uh, 32 months old baby girl who had a, actually a viral infection, and you can see what we call the virucides, the blue cells, but somehow clinically she seems sick, Finally, I think the buck stops with how the clinician feels. And then when we look closely, there were some which looked more sinister. I hope it's clear from there. The chromatin pattern is much open. This is another such cell. Here you can see one reactive cell and one blast-like cell. And because of this, uh, we went ahead with the marrow and the marrow was full of blasts. And after that, we actually I have had one case here with dengue and BLL and flow proved that this was BLL. So this was just to highlight that when we say typical cells could be reactive cells along with some neoplastic cells and something like BLL. And usually when we talk about the basophilic cytoplasm uh, and uh, sometimes even reactive cells, if you look at the descriptions or review articles, activated lymphocytes, you can have cytoplasmic vacuolation. But remember when we see a cell like this, even a single cell, one or two cells, with, in this case there was leukoerythroblastosis, we will think about a Burkitt's cell or Burkitt's lymphoma. Earlier it was called the L3 type of blast. L3 morphology, but today we know that this is a high-grade lymphoma, which looks like a blast, so it's a blastoid cell, and you have a hyperbasophilic, very blue cytoplasm with vacuolizations. And uh, if sometimes, because this is a very highly proliferative tumor, so even in peripheral blood, you may have apoptotic cells, dying cells. And uh, the, this was a marrow, which was a bit dilute, but of course, this is a mature cell. So there's a mature B cell marker. You can have, surf you should have surface immunoglobulins and absence of immature markers. And classically, you have CD10 is positive, just like a BLL. So it's important to show that 
um, usually TDT and CD34 are negative, and there is presence of surface immunoglobulin. Confirmation is always by flow, and here we have a classical uh, cytogenetic marker as well. And this is something we are all familiar with. We CLL cells, we say they are small cells, but in reality, they are small as compared to other neoplastic cells. So from reactive cells, we are moving on to neoplastic cells, where, again, the lymphoid, we can have variety of appearances. And I want to show you that even in today's day of flow cytometry, morphology does help, at least to decide maybe on the panel and how quickly we should do the flow. And uh, so this is a classical CLL cell, small cells, but slightly larger than normal lymphocytes, small lymphocytes. And the chromatin is even more clumpier or coarse than a normal lymphocyte. And uh, these are the smudge cells. And similarly, we have some small cells in a 55-year-old male who was actually admitted for investigation of pyrox pyrexia of unknown origin. All the cultures were negative. The peripheral smear review was done only because there was slight leukocytosis and the slide review criteria in the lab were fulfilled. So the peripheral smear was seen. And there was nothing dramatic, just a leukocytosis with fever of 20,000, slight lymphocytosis. You can see there are normal platelets and a near normal hemoglobin. And these cells are small, but they're definitely different from what we just saw. These cells appear, there's hardly any cytoplasm. Even, they look even smaller, a little bit of notching, tendency for cleaving, so that uh, prompted by us, the clinicians look for lymph nodes, which were finally a lymph node biopsy, and flow confirmed, or we suggested a diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, which is again a mature B cell neoplasm, so they are all CD19 positive with kappa uh, expression without lambda, and low-grade follicular lymphomas will typically have CD10 expression. So the morphology is quite characteristic, though they are also small cells. But flow confirmation is a must. Sometimes we know that these are, this is a very classic morphology of a pro-lymphocyte. It's said that it's about twice the size of a small lymphocyte with a chromatin pattern that is intermediate, in between, like a blast would be completely open while the others will be very coarse so it's in between and you have a very prominent central nucleolus so and usually the counts are very high splenomegaly is uh, characteristic and the flow will only show you a b cell mature immunophenotype it's not very characteristic cd5 may be sometimes positive sometimes negative it's not earlier it was thought it's related to cll it's a different entity altogether. So this was a B PLL, pro-lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, so pro-lymphocytic leukemia can arise from T cells also. There's a slight difference in the morphology compared to the other cells. They are more lobulated, the cytoplasmic blebbing. The nucleoli are not as prominent as they were there. Count, in this case, the count was, I think, around 200,000. And again, flow, but the morphology itself, we thought it's something different. And the flow showed that we suggested, of course, a diagnosis of a T PLL. So morphologically, they are quite uh, distinct. You can see these are very classical, and these are a little different, and they turned out to be T PLL. Then this was another interesting case uh, a 60 year old male who came with some um, lytic lesions all over his skeleton. So the oncologist already said this is a case of multiple myeloma. But in the peripheral blood, you can see platelets are nearly, hemoglobin is nearly normal, platelets are slightly low, and absolutely normal differential. Neutrophils are normal. You can see three neutrophils here. But there were these occasional large cells, which looked like a blast, actually. Large cells, high NC ratio, dispersed chromatin pattern. I actually, a technician brought it to me. I wanted to ignore one cell, leave it. No, no there were about 11% cells. And the clinical diagnosis was multiple myeloma. But from the morphology, 
you have adequate neutrophils. So if it was a myeloid blast, very un unlikely. If the marrow is so involved, you won't have near normal platelets, unlikely. If it was plasma cells, you would expect with so many lytic lesions that some protein, some background staining should be there. So we thought and we just commented and it was later the biopsy came to be all DLBCL. So sometimes DLBCL and I have had the experience of DLBCL with peripheral blood involvement with a count of 65,000 which was like unbelievable. And uh, so this was DLBCL. So if it was really a very disseminated myeloma, you'd expect a dirty background, poor staining, that's why the photograph is also bad. And this also can look like an atypical lymphoid cell. And uh, so when we are talking about pro-lymphocytes and we are talking about these big cells, this is a classical hairy cell. So it's also large, larger than the lymphocyte with a chromatin pattern that is intermediate again in between a blast, easiest to understand it like that, indistinct nucleolus. We may get these kind of hairy like projections, fine projections all around. If you get them, very nice. But again, the difference from say, we will not confuse with something else because usually there's pancytopenia, monocytopenia, splenomegaly is expected. Uh, other DDs are atypical hairy cell, SLVL. So sometimes just a peripheral smear can give us a diagnosis. This was a 40-year-old female who actually had hemolytic anemia. First came for hemolytic anemia with a big spleen, which was just some hemolytic anemia cannot explain, but there were no lymph nodes. Somehow the peripheral smear had not been looked at properly, and we saw some atypical cells with a tendency for some cytoplasmic projection, though they seem all over, but with a tendency to be on one side, polarized, and with a big spleen, without finding anything else. LDH was high. Uh, the patient was started on rituximab and did much better. Hemoglobin improved. Spleen was definitive diagnosis would have been um, splenectomy, but the marrow on HNE, you know, you really cannot, they're very subtle infiltrates, which are picked up, interstitially involved B cells. That's the only information we could give. So this was uh, um, really a rare case. This was a small child who came with monocytosis. So usually if it's not a hematologic center, you know, without a trained hematologist, so many monocytosis, uh, we think of infection or they're missed. So it came to us, so I was very excited that I said, this is likely to be, you know, JMML because monocyte count was very high. And, uh, and they were all, these cells were counted as monocytes. So I said, this is JMML, do all the molecular tests. And even the clinician was very happy with the answer. There was hepatosplenomegaly, child was very sick, and there were some lymph nodes, which can happen with JMML. And we see quite a few cases of JMML. So, but the pa uh, parents and JMML really flow doesn't pay, play a big role. But you know, just make sure there are no blasts, just do it. Sometimes the parents want, so a flow was done. And I was just thinking that they're all monocytes. And, but all these big cells, which are actually falling in the mono gate, they are negative for monocytic markers. Instead, they were positive for T cell markers. And by the time patient left, and you know, I really couldn't understand that there's this aberrant population that needs to be looked at. You know, one of those vague reports that you feel very ashamed of later on. I'm sure all of us do it at some point of time. But luckily somebody had done a lymph node biopsy. Patient went away and this child had an ALK lymphoma. So an ALK lymphoma circulating in peripheral blood is really rare and very bad prognosis. Child came back to actually India but this was a lesson learned that, you know, anything, then I went back, studied, took many photographs. And if you go back, yeah, some of them, there are some smaller cells also. I'm sure these are also the neoplastic cells. And there was a few monocytes. But in my count, in the differential count, I counted almost about 19% monocytes. But here, when I went back, it was much less. And I really couldn't explain, kept analyzing, uh, you know, took help. And uh, so this was a, let's say, bummer, you know, absolutely. Just wanted to share with all of you. 
So when I have sh shown that, uh, and people have with COVID-19, you know, we can see activated lymphocytes. So there are lots of papers and uh, you, you all have done enormous work on COVID-19. I haven't done much, but people have also looked at presence of reactive lymphocytes. You seem to, these patients seem to do better. And uh, so there are papers and if you can somehow make it more objective using any of these artificial intelligence systems, it seems to even help in prognosticating. But so when we can have such a gamut of cases, you know, where you have atypical lymphoid cells, so it's really not correct to use the term atypical lymphoid cells and leave it. So what are the guidelines? So if we follow the European guidelines that came out some time ago, so they said even on morphology itself, based on just morphology, if you are relatively sure that this looks like reactive, mention reactive. Reactive means it's benign or abnormal lymphocyte or atypical lymphocyte. Suspect, neoplastic. Suspect, nobody can put you in jail later on even if it's not. And if uncertain, it's good to put down that also. And the ICH is uh, the International Committee for Standardization in Hematology. They also suggest certain things that, um, and so I would like to conclude that, you know, we have seen that lymphocyte with any morphological aberration, even if it's reactive, would be often labeled as an atypical lymph and the buck really doesn't stop there. And there's a whole lot of terminology and uh, including monocytoid lymphocytes because they look like monocytes and, uh, but one should attempt to use terminology which would be of some use to the clinician. So, um, and according to the ICSH, reactive lymphocyte of usually means benign, while an abnormal lymphocyte means neoplastic. Some say that reactive lymphocyte means benign, while you know, a lymphoid cell means probably neoplastic. And the ICHS also recognizes, though they have laid some guidelines, that country to country, region to region, you know, people may be more familiar with some terms and not so familiar with others. And uh, whatever, whatever atypical lymphocytes you see, if it's one or two percentage, it's good to mention on the peripheral blood film. If they're of significant number, they should be included in the differential count. But unless flow or something is proven what they are, you should just not, you know, put your opinion there, unless it's as distinctive as a pro-lymphocyte or even hairy cell, you just say atypical cells, still flow proves. But if it is, uh, uh, strangely, of course, if it's a blast, you're sure it's, it's a blast. That should be in the differential count. And um, as I have said that um, artificial intelligence guided Objective morphology may be useful as people are already finding. There are experiences, there are papers. And um, I would like to end with this present uh, this case, which was published in 2020 in The Lancet. So old is really gold, I would like to say, because this particular case is a classical case of infectious mononucleosis. So in 1935, we had those illustrations of it, such beautiful pictures. Downey and McKinley had, uh, you know, described three types of cells, type one, type two, type three. And I want to just show you this type two cells. They seem to hug the surrounding cells. So once you see this phenomena, you are a little more confident that these are reactive cells giving it a scalloped appearance, so type 1, type 2, type 3. So this Lancet paper describes these cells, and this picture is from the Lancet. And they did IgM for Epstein-Barr virus. It was negative. All the markers were negative. Then they went back to the peripheral smear. There are some criteria that 80% cells should be, you know, uh, atypical appearing. And they made a diagnosis based on this, and it was proven by PCR. So. Perhaps morphology still plays a role. We can, of course, make it more objective. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Panshi. That was really very uh, interesting and also uh, right, cleared some of the doubts. But this has always been a very gray area of what you call atypical or what you call abnormal or what you call reactive. So, or activated lymphocytes, so many different terminologies. So, perhaps digital imaging may help in this one area, I feel to standardize the nomenclature of the kinds of lymphocytes we see. 
but uh, that is, I think, a huge exercise for the future. So, any questions on this? Yeah, hi. <laughs> Beautiful presentation, Dr. Pankhi. I really liked it because, you know, this is something we keep on facing on a day-to-day basis. True. So, uh, you know, while working in a tertiary care center, we come across cases where people are just writing sometimes atypical, sometimes abnormal, sometimes reactive, transformed. So there are multiple terms which have been used for these so-called suspicious-looking cells. And when they come to us, uh, I think very important point, I mean, you have already highlighted the multiple uh, points, important points which one has to keep in mind. One is like the, one should start from the history, I'll say. True. So that is something we cannot ignore because that gives us light, but despite a history, we have to use all our senses, you know, in terms of uh, getting ahead and we cannot just stop calling them atypical. Like recently, just maybe, uh, three, four days back, we came across a case where the uh, somebody labeled us as atypical lymphoid cell, then somebody called them even erythroid leukemia. Okay. And when this young guy came to us, the peripheral blood to our surprise was full of uh, such kind of so-called atypical looking cells, which we ourselves were not sure, you know, which category it is. And then we just kept on investigating of course, we landed in a flow, and it was a plasma cell leukemia. Young boy. Never expected. Oh, that that's a bummer, cell. like this case, yeah. okay. So this was like an... How old was the patient? Patient was not too old, maybe in 40s. Oh, okay. Yeah. 40s, so okay. I think uh, uh, what people are using the term, maybe atypical word is something very non-specific when we don't know, but transformed, uh, reactive, definitely point towards a reactive cause or a benign cause. And I personally body. feel, I'm nobody, there are guidelines, but yes, when we say atypical, yes. it means something sinister, you right, know. Right. Uh, while atypical was actually, it came from the infectious mononucleus, right. of the downy cells, yeah. so that term has stayed, so it's right. very vague. It's also a leave, leave away when you're not sure, just write atypical and <laughs> get no, away. I really like the, but the cases you shared with thank us. You thank so you so much, so kind of you. I also have a question here. Uh, uh, hi. We hi, we come from the same state, Assam. Yes. <laughs> no? Same college. So what happens is that uh, in our slides we do get activated lymphocytes. We don't write atypical, but I take home a message that we can give a certain guideline. If we are not suppose we do not have flow, uh, we can give reactive like atypical, not atypical. We write activated lymphocyte. Could we write reactive? As long as you, yeah, mom thoughts. This conundrum is really this thing. You can look at these guidelines also. Yeah, it's but there RCPA, thankfully, RCPA yeah. this year, they have come up with a term which is known as abnormal lymphocytes. So anything which we were writing, atypical, activated, reactive, query, all that, now it all goes into abnormal lymphocytes. So since now there is a guideline for RCPA, we have started using the term abnormal lymphocytes for these kind of cells. Yeah, but just saying abnormal, like, you know, whether it is, what yeah. do you think? Is it reactive? Because abnormal, is it a lymphoma cell? If you can, if you're reasonably confident, it's good to put down that. Exactly. That's all, uh, that's the whole thing from my talk. Yeah. And secondly, I really wanted to highlight this, the virucytes with blasts. I have got quite a few cases, maybe three, four. So sometimes when you see these, you will say that, oh, it's a viral infection, but it has happened, and so you have to be careful about that also. I think that's all. And another thing on this morphology, when we were talking about COVID-19. Yeah, you so have a lot of Dr. experience. So as Dr. Suri already pointed out, the NLR is more because of the apoptosis of the lymphocytes, and not only apoptosis, various mechanism, because of which the patient undergoes into a lymphocytopenia, and that's how the NLR increases. So to our surprise, because we have always been thinking that viral infections, so there will be more morphology yeah. on lymphocytes, like abnormal, atypical, reactive, activated, all that. But we again conducted a study, and to our surprise, we found that there was a lot of morphological changes actually in the neutrophils. So there we had these acquired angulated neutrophils, acquired pelger root, of course, apoptosis, toxic granulation. So reactive lymphocyte actually came fifth or sixth in our list of 
the 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 enumerated uh, morphology. Actually, this paper just said that if they're present and they're a little different from the other cells, I'm also not that convinced. But if they're present, these patients seem to do better because probably the immune response mounted is better. That's what. I mean, it might just stimulate somebody to do more work. <laughs> yeah. Nice talk, Dr. Panki. Thank you. Punky. It, Thank it, you. It, it is a morphological kind of a treat. <laughs> Thank you. I think pathologist. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, just one question. Uh, you said ki we should not uh, mix like activated lymphocyte can be seen with glass. So do scatter plots help differentiating? Like have you seen activated lymphocyte showing high fluorescence lymphocyte and the merging of mono and lympho together? Frankly speaking, I have no idea. I use a um, coulter. I, okay. I don't look at the plots. But you do have the high fluorescent lymphocytes. Cells. Anyway, it'll be there. They'll be anyway atypical. And we see those flags for atypical lymph. Uh, but it could be blast. It could be actually it, what we say atypical lymph. Okay. Because when I see the PS, I look at the scatter of blasts. I doubt it'll really differentiate that these extra blasts are present. I, I don't know. Oh, it's, I don't okay. have the experience. Okay.